to lift that thing and pull it somewhere that can be a plan. And it's a good point, isn't it, that we in this good church that comes to the cross actually looks at our story last week and into West Ham and thought, and to one of them there, you, you feel it's a tricky one. And yet they look to the Lord to be going this kind of way. So this might just be to perform to live this kind of time. I think the momentum is going to be easy for them, but you could be spoiled in this one way. And the objective there for Paul was to let himself go early. He had a few to get past. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I hope you can all see my screen, but uh, I want to encourage all of us to lay aside the weight of passivity, being passive. Um, and that is a, a, a common human inclination. Uh, not to stretch and uh, to accept average as your level of measurement. Our mindsets make a huge difference in how we perceive our circumstances. What we expect shapes how we respond. So if we expect peace, we will resent having to fight. If we expect rest, we will resent having to endure. If we expect leisure, we will resent having to work hard. I'm talking about uh, overcoming or laying aside the weight of passivity. Uh, any weight is cumbersome to carry. So that's why it's so important for us, particularly in this class, this master's class, to prepare our minds for action. First Peter 1 13. It's clear in the New Testament that the Holy Spirit wants us to prepare to fight a grueling war, to run an endurance race, and to engage in the difficult work of kingdom farming. This is scripture, but the analogy is the same for us at Daystar. I told you in this class, I want you to prepare your minds for action. You have exactly 18 months to graduate. We are winding up research methods, statistics, policy studies, and now I want to introduce you to your proposals. So it is clear Daystar we want you to prepare for a grueling war, to run an endurance race, and to engage in difficult work for you to get a quality master's degree. And by the way, when you get a quality master's degree, then you are doing kingdom farming because you'll come out a better person and you'll exemplify that intellectual that will stand in for Christ. So I want you to prepare for action. I wish I could say this better, but I want you to prepare for action. And uh, that's where we are going. Now, Paul captures all three analogies in his exhortation, in his exhortation to Timothy. And this is what he says. To Timothy, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. So without suffering, you cannot perfect yourself. No soldier gets entangled in civilian 
Passwits. Since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. So in your case, in this course, I don't want you to be entangled with the, with the average. I don't want you to, I want you to punish yourself to suffer so that you understand the theory of research methods. And when it comes to writing your proposal, it is uh, a proposal that people say, wow, but not people God will be happy with. And more importantly, you'll be preparing strongly for your PhD. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. So the other night, uh, the library, uh, the senior librarian was putting you through Zotera and EndNotes and so on. Uh, make sure you learn those things so that you can be a good example for the kingdom. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. So I'm waiting, I'm waiting very anxiously to see my class of 55 plus students line up for graduation and with distinction. Going to the scriptures, think over what I say. This is Paul to Timothy. For the Lord will give you understanding in everything. And by the way, if you allow yourself to suffer, if you go by the rules, if you work hard, God, our Lord will give you understanding in everything that you are learning in this program. As Christians, we are not called to easy passivity, but to rigorous activity. So me, I, I know for sure you are not called to, sorry, this, this spelling, I typed this right, wrong. Yeah, this should be like that. You are called not for the easy life, but you are called for the strenuous life. So as Christians, we are not called to easy passivity but to rigorous activity. So Paul wants Timo Timothy and us to think over what he says. He wants us to engage in expectation-shaping thinking. And that's what I'm trying to do with you people. We are going deep into all aspects of research so that you can engage in expectation-shaping thinking because no, Paul knows the crucial importance of mindsets. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds in the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Romans 5, 8, 5. This, their end is destruction. Their God is in their belly, and their glory is their shame, with minds set on earthly things. Again, we can carry this, this uh, scripture into this program. If you just sit here and say, me, so long as I get a pass and uh, I get my master's degree, that paper will just remain a paper. And it will bring shame to you because then when you sit with your equals or other people, you are the types who want to remind everybody, you know, I have done a master's. Because it is not seen in you. So set your minds on things that are above, not on, thi not on things that are on earth. Colossians 3, 2. I can carry this into our situation and say, set your minds on the highest and not on the average. 
So the Holy Spirit speaking in Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, 3 to 7, wants us to have a soldier's mindset, which is very different from our civilians. A soldier expects to suffer the rigors and danger of war, a civilian does not. Some of you have had experiences in other public universities, in public universities. Some of you I know did your coursework and abandoned it on the way. So your mindset must be very different in this class. And you must be prepared to suffer the rigors and the expectations of this course, just like Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 2, 3 to 7, a soldier expects to suffer the rigors and dangers of war, a civilian does not. So the Spirit wants us, the Spirit wants us to have a, an athlete's mindset, which is very different from a spectator's. Every athlete expects to exercise self-control in all things in order to win the prize. A spectator does not. 1 Corinthians 9.25 So, as the Spirit wants us to have a farmer's mindset, which is very different from an average customer's, a farmer expects to work hard for long hours, over long months, in all kinds of weather, to realize a, ha a harvest. A customer does not. Civilians are passive during war. Spectators are passive during competition. An average customer is passive during the growing season. And as Christians, we are not called to easy passivity, but to rigorous activity. That is my message to you. Therefore, we must prepare our minds for action. I think this will be, the sermon goes on, but this will be my takeaway for you. That, uh, what am I saying? As Christians, as master students in a Christian university such as Deista, we are not called for easy passivity, but to rigorous activity. Therefore, we must prepare our minds for action. Ladies and gentlemen, may it be said of you that you indeed went through rigorous activity to get that master's degree and it will be seen in your actions and you're standing in for the kingdom of Christ and that you are not called to any easy passivity as is witnessed in other universities. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are seeking for action. We are seeking for toil. We are seeking for resilience. We are seeking for courage. Lord, we are seeking for a teachable spirit so that this class will shine and be an example of soldiers of your kingdom. For I pray this in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Um, I would like uh, to pause uh, and uh, now move on to the class. Uh, please always reflect on our devotions. Uh, and uh, I always send them to you after the class to, to accompany your notes. I didn't send you the notes on mixed methods because I wanted to finish the presentation, then send the whole PowerPoint, which I'm doing today after this class. So again, this class would be uh, a sort of very easy class. Uh, because we are just wrapping up. And uh, I therefore expect uh, a lot of participation, a lot of questions. Uh, so that uh, 
we are beginning to ask ourselves in which paradigm would we walk in? And I'm just recapping. Last time we said we were here and we said in mixed methods, you have to determine your worldview. Uh, post pos positivism or positivism, that is quantitative strategy, and you are engaged in theory verification. So you do empirical observation, you will go out there with your questionnaires and interviews, do the necessary measurement of data and then analyze, relate variables, and verify the theory. There is constructivism or interpretivism, which calls for understanding, for multiple participant meanings, for social and historical construction, and so you are doing theory generation. So, for example, in this case of theory verification, there is the this theory, education, sorry, there's this theory, education, production, function theory, education, production, uh, function theory, um, which is by an economist called Hanushek. And he says that uh, for you to get quality in education, several factors must be put in. Some of the things that must be put in is capacity of the teachers, infrastructure, the entry behavior of the students, the environment, and many other factors. So there is already a theory. And now all you go yourself is to go and measure or verify whether CBC holds true when subjected to the education production function theory model. So you can do your study on CBC, go and find out the capacity, the numbers of the teachers, the instructional materials, the inf infrastructure, and then tell us, does CBC implementation hold true to the education production function model? On the other hand, if you come this side, you are dealing with, and I, I emphasize this, you are dealing with phenomenon. You are dealing with phenomenon. So you are dealing with social constructs, sorry. You are dealing with social constructs, phenomenon. You are dealing with social so phenomenon like, for example, poverty, you are dealing with phenomenon like circumcision, circumcision, circum sorry, circumcision. You are dealing with phenomenon like um, uh, addiction, ETC. So what you're going to do is you're going to want to establish an understanding as a qualitative researcher around e each of these phenomena that you are dealing with. It could even be a phenomenon like communication. Like communication. So you're dealing with this phenomenon. And you'll get multiple participant meanings. So
So if you're talking about poverty and you're talking to the World Bank, it will give you a different perspective of poverty. If you're talking to the government of Kenya, it will be different. When you're talking to the Catholic Church about poverty, and when you're talking about poverty to the residents of Kibera, you'll have multiple participant meanings. And you begin to construct your own thinking about the phenomenon poverty. Then you will give us an idea of what you think is the cause of poverty and how it can be overcome. And then eventually you begin to generate some theory for people to interrogate and find out whether your results make sense or not. Ladies and gentlemen, it is important for you to appreciate these different paradigms of research as we move along. Uh, because of mixed methods, you will engage with both positivism, theory verification, and constructivism, theory generation depending on what you are studying. I'll want to encourage many of you to then pick on streams or learning spaces or learning areas such as advocacy and participatory. So you'll be talking about, for example, the failure of political parties in Kenya to enhance democ democracy. Is it a myth or a reality? For example, empowering issue-oriented politics, collaborative approaches to development. You can also be pragmatic, pragmatic, where you're looking at the consequences of actions it is problem centered it is pluralistic it is not it is not one path it is not north and south qualitative and quantitative and then you can bring around real world practice so what am i trying to do i'm trying to disengage your mind not to just think of research in terms of qualitative and quantitative studies if you remember this whole aspect sits in the air of philosophy and assumptions. And so a good researcher should be telling me, I am going to go mixed methods. I'll be both constructivist and positivist, but my study will relate around advocacy for the poor in the slums of Nairobi. And I want to evolve some policy that will mitigate the suffering they're going through. Some of you will want to be pragmatic. You'll want to look at both quantitative and qualitative aspects of, of, of uh, a situation, like the poverty index in, in, in disadvantaged areas in Kenya, and then you give us a real world practice approach to that problem. And that's why mixed methods then becomes very exciting. I have talked about the paradigm you walk in. Just know that mixed methods is pragmatic, pragmatism, and it is transformative, according to Tashakori. Tedley and Mittens. This approach, mixed methods, gives us multiple paradigms. Dialectic perspective, green 2007. So I expect a good student of a year old to highlight this like this, to quickly highlight this, this. And if you are on the internet, I expect you to, to do smart looking up and find out what does this mean? Is there is there any information? And you can see, just as I'm reading this, there is 
dialectic, also known as dialectical method, refers originally to dialogue between people holding different points of view about a subject but wishing to arrive at the truth. So again, don't read blindly. Don't read blindly. And then it gives you more perspectives. Now, when it comes to dialectical, dialectical perspectives like here, you can go to the encyclopedia. You can go to the encyclopedia, click there, and it gives you the reading on it. These are the type of students I would like to see in my class. I don't expect you to, to just go blindly um, reading, and yet you don't quite comprehend what it is or where it is that you're going. So I, I, as budding researchers, when you are sitting at the table, This mute. So you are, don't just read epistemological stance and move on. Highlight ontology. What does it mean? We have learned this with a hero. What does this ontology mean? So you'll go to the Theosaras and find out what is ontology. If it says it has no results, you then go back and you do smart looking up or you look for the synonyms of ontology. And uh, eventually you'll get here. You see ontology tells you what it is. And uh, so as you read, you are engaged with the material. You are not passive. So you see like here in research methods, Look at this. I'll go back again. Don't worry. Ontology and epistemology are two different ways of viewing the research philosophy. Ontology in business research can be defined as a science or the study of being, and it deals with the nature of reality. Ontology is a system of belief that reflects an interpretation of an individual about what constitutes a fact. In simple terms, Ontology is associated with what we consider as reality. And then you see, you are lucky. It then talks about epistemology, methodology, methods. So because you are not passive, you can still get deeper into, into those aspects as you move on. So I expect a lot of intensive and uh, active study from you as you go along. I hope I'm making sense. Um, I told you about uh, Lincoln and Guba. Guba uh, is at Texas A&M, and I had a privilege to work with her on parts of my book in qualitative studies. She's, she's, the, she's the mother of uh, qualitative research globally, among the highest rated uh, qualitative researchers. Now, I then talked about make explicit your interpret in interpretive lens, your theory. Make it explicit. Uh, explicit. The advocacy, the advocacy lens, which lens are you wearing? Is it feminist? Is it racial? Is it ethnic? Is it disability? 
Is it social, social orientation? Or are you wearing a social science lens? Engaging the social science theory. So where are you? By the way, it's very interesting. Uh, we have a faculty in Daystar who is on sabbatical in Calvin University. Uh, she's a Maasai lady. And uh, she she does a lot of work. She's she is the director of the Center for Theology and Gender Issues at Calvin. And she, she has published many papers on sexual orientation. Uh, and uh, somebody read some of her papers and was furious with me. How can you have such a person on your, on your staff? But you see, <laughs> the person doesn't understand that Calvin uh, wants us to research in QLBT. Uh, QLGBT, we need to research around those sexual orientations, those different aspects. Just like Desta now has gotten uh, uh, initial grants from the council or the, the consortium for Christian universities and colleges to study the Shakahola phenomenon, the Shakahola massacre. Now, does it mean we are adherents? No. So, uh, Let's be careful, the lens, the theory that one is adapting. Um, procedures for handling your qualitative and quantitative data. Remember, you're going to have both qualitative and quantitative data. So the sequence is important. Would you be concurrent? Would you be collecting the two together? Uh, go to a place, collect qualitative and quantitative data. Or will you collect qualitative, analyze it, get the results, then now seek to go and do a quantitative study to validate what you have just collected or to triangulate the results that you have found? I think I want to spend some time on this because we've got to get this right. There is sequence, then there is emphasis. Uh, so I'll be, when you are doing when you are adapting the qualitative method, I'll be asking you, what is your sequence? Is it concurrent or sequential or is it embedded or is it both? Then I'll be asking you, what is your emphasis? Is it on qualitative or quantitative? So some studies will be uh, leaning, biased towards quantitative, others towards qualitative, and I would like the emphasis brought out. Sometimes both concurrent and sequential phases are used and designs may include more than two phases. So think about using a simple, elegant design. Don't be too complicated when it comes to your, your design. So I'd like to see uh, what happens. Um, yeah, LGBTQA. Whatever it is, I can see people helping me out. Uh, Macho and Taslino Nyango and, and the rest, yeah. So it, it really doesn't, it doesn't make you one. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't make you one. Yeah, you are a researcher. So you are trying to, to make a difference. Now let us look at this sequence and uh, let me blow this up. And... Uh, so uh, let's go back. Let me blow this up. And uh, in fact, I want to escape first. Let me end the show. Uh, you see this word. Does anybody know the meaning? Can somebody help me even before, before I check? What is the meaning of that word? Uh, what is the meaning of this word? Uh, Parsimonious. Parsimonious is it is not a it is in the language register for research, but it is an English word. Parsimonious. You see, I, I don't want passive students. So when you see a word like that, you have to tell me what does that word mean? Look at here. Um I can look at several 
examples. And I love this word. I like, I like bringing it up and again. And I want disciples out of here. Uh, whenever you see the word parsimonious, you'll, you'll see this, what is Occam's razor? And, and uh, let me go here. Look here. Let me go here. I'm, I'm trying not to be passive. This is a guiding principle or logic exhorting us to keep things as simple as possible. Occam's Reza. Parsimony is the ability or the skill of being brief. And in Deista, I was shocked when I came to Deista and I started reading emails. You would read pages of emails and when you look through it, the message was just one point. Then I was told, you know, Ayiro, you are a scientist. This is a communication school. But I am saying, when it comes to my thesis, the ones I will supervise, my proposals, I want you to be brief and simple. So Occam's Reza is a principle often attributed to 14th century Friar William of Occam that says that if you have two competing ideas to explain the same phenomenon, you should prefer the simpler one. And uh, we know that Albert Einstein hated long narratives and Newton, Isaac Newton. So you try to be parsimonious, by adapting Occam's razor. Una kata, use that razor as an asset, a razor blade. You cut out things until you are, remain very simple. That's why maths is a disciple of that principle. You summarize. So it's up to you to, to read this. Uh, look at this. This. Occam's Reza, the medieval monk who saw the power of simplicity. William of Occam has had was tried for heresy before the Pope, only to make a daring escape. His big idea, known as Occam's Reza, remains the keenest tool for honing our understanding of the world. And, and all they are saying, please be logical. Please be logical. So I've talked about parsimonious, uh, and I hope that uh, parsimony will become part of us. And when I'm reading your thesis, I'll be saying, where is Occam's razor? That's a common question I ask many of you, because you write too much. Uh, watch any poet kidogo uh, to hear any comments on what I have said so far. And that has nothing to do with research. Parsimonious. Being parsimonious, all comes razor. But just remember that if you're going to become a good researcher, please be part of this philosophy. Any uh, observation, any comment? Uh, we haven't gone to this. Don't don't ask about the slide before you, but what I've said. <clears throat> yes, Chris, yes, sir. Thank you, Prof. Uh, just a comment that uh, I think is my take home today. Mm. Um, that even as I plan to begin my research, I need to be as brief as possible, mm. reduce the content, but mm. give out the most important points mm. that I need to be parsimony. Mm. Thank you. You need to be parsimonious. I need to be parsimonious. Thank you, Prof. Yeah, you know, I, I have written a submission to the Commission for University of Education 
It's, it's very interesting. They, they are telling me, they are telling people that uh, your thesis must have 5,000 words, PhD. I, I find that ridiculous. Because me, I've seen theses of less than 100 pages from Harvard, from MIT. It is not the words, the volumes of repetitions there. No, 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 no. But that's for another. Any other comment there? Any observation as we pause a little just to let people? Oh, very good. Two participants, uh, Akini Brenda, then Taslin Otieno. Please go ahead. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Uh, um, so I have just also come across the word parsimonious and I've uh, quickly learned that uh, I need to be very clear and at the same time be quite effective. And this will enable access, easy access to my points and uh, become very impactful in my write-up. So mm. I think simplicity is usually uh, very key in, in, in writing because it, it avoids the too much use of wordings and, yeah. you know, someone has to really struggle to even get your main point from your write-up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very good. Uh, Otieno, that was Brenda. Yes, that was Brenda. Okay, uh, Otieno, Taslin. Yes, good evening, Prop. Uh, um, I would say that... Uh, uh, the pro is it Professor Pielo Limumba is not a parsimonious orator. <laughs> yeah, um, I love that. Um, do you do you see? Let me. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Do you see? Can I? I I want to. I want. I don't know how many of you, and I don't want to cut up your hand. I just want to ask you. Uh. Uh. This, what I have put here on this slide uh, are parsimonious designs on mixed methods. You know, I don't have to write pages and pages and pages of notes. After I have taught you and you have read through my notes, then this mind map, this diagram uh, upholds the Occam's Reza principle or demonstrates parsimony. So let's go through it. This is concurrent mixed method design. Concurrent. And this is the triangulation design. So listen carefully. Triangulation. To triangulate is kudhibitisha kuandoa hofu uh, kuchanua kama kuna uongo na kadhalika. So, kwan, and you know kwan from our notation is quantitative. So, let's go back to my study with this doctor in uh, Bomet or Kericho County on the prevalence of uh, tuberculosis, TB. We go and collect quantitative data with him. We analyze the results. We see the amount of drugs we are giving. We see the visits to the clinics. We see mortality and morbidity rates. We then do a qual study, qualitative, with the same population. We look for information-rich respondents like a patient suffering from TB or the chief of an area. And we interview them and say, why is TB increasing? And yet we are giving medicine and yet people are coming to the clinic and yet we are giving food rations. And the patient tells me, you know, I have seven grandchildren in this home. So I, the food they give me from the hospital, my grandchildren must eat fast. And because I've not eaten, I can't take the drugs. And so the TB multiplies. So you take the quantitative data, the qualitative data, you bring it together for interpretation. I hope that is a very simple approach. Then 
So you are doing this concurrently. You are, you are collecting quantitative analyzing, qualitative analyzing, then interpretation. The embedded design. Yes. Sorry, bro. Um, Go ahead. Just, okay, just a, a repeat on that uh, example. It is very catching, and I would mm. maybe just to understand it better. Where yeah. you talk about yeah. taking the quantitative data and the qualitative data uh, from the question you're asking the mother, the grandmother yeah. or the mother there. So where is the quan? Where is the qual? Because uh, it's just one participant the there. Quan, the quan mm -hmm. is the measured data we collected from the hospital okay. of people going to hospital we went to the pharmacy, we looked at the distribution of drugs, the volumes of drugs going out. We went to the food section, we saw how much food is being given. We looked at the age profiles of the sick people, the demographics. We looked at their level of education. We Those are all measurable quantities. We analyzed that situation. The qual is when we go with an open interview and ask the chief, Mbona ETB but when we go in, inside, the mother says, it's not me alone, so I can't take the drugs. The food they give me, I use it with my grandchildren. I'm just giving that as an example. So once you have those results, from the quantitative and qualitative, you bring them together for interpretation. That is interpretation and discussion of the results. Chapter four. Then there is the embedded design. And, and, and uh, please don't lose me. The, you do, you can look at, in an embedded design, you can look at this one quantitative as a pretest of data and results. Because you haven't you haven't quite come out with the interpretation. So you can look at it as a pretest. But I can also remove this. I can remove this. I can expand that. Here you have, look here. The Quan now post test data. You did a pretest, or you did the piloting. And then you went out and did the actual collection of data. So you see both quantitative, the pretest, the post test, and then there is an intervention, the qual process. This qual process is embedded in the two quantitative processes. That is what is called embedding. And by the way, I can also remove this, I can remove this post test. And just say, I did a huge quantitative study. Then I did a small qualitative process. And then it intervened between my data, the quantitative data. And then I was able to do interpretation. I'm pausing for questions. And I want you to note that what I'm teaching you now uh, goes slightly beyond your master's program. But if you can understand this, uh, and I don't see why you can't understand this, and internalize this, then we are putting you at a very big advantage moving forward. Any comment, any worry? If there isn't, I'll move on. All right. Now, okay, Madiang, please. Uh, uh, thank you very much and good evening. <clears throat> now, um, the embedded one is very interesting. Yes. I recall uh, when you were uh, earlier helping us understand the Quan and uh, Qual, mm. you mentioned two things. Mm. Quantitative will have a bigger sample than mm. the qualitative. Yes. Then we also uh, agreed that uh, qualitative sometimes, uh, sometimes is now my word, mm. seems to explain mm. quantitative. Yeah. Uh, using the example of the Nakuru TB case and the grandmother yeah. and the circumstance yeah. of the children, I, I, yeah. get, I get the 
triangulation part of it. Yes. But now, in terms of the embedded, mm. is, is the qual at the middle intended mm. to bring about uh, changes in the second quantitative uh, 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 research? Not are at we, all. Are we looking at uh, changes between Quan mm. 1 and Quan 2, if I were to use that? Over no, no. You see, Quan 1, I, I'm just stretching mm -hmm. you a bit. Quan, mm -hmm. this, this one is a pretest. Yeah. Mm. So you are actually validating your instruments for data collection. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Then you do the actual data collection. But okay. I am introducing Qual. And I want Qual to speak both to the pretest and the post-test. Mm -hmm. But I also want to, the class to get out of this notion. This is just an example. In other places, in other your study, the Qual could have been the bigger. You get? Okay. Okay. For example, mm. I have gone to observe the circumcision rights among our brothers, the Bukusus in Bungoma. The data I'll collect there, the biggest data is qualitative because it is observation. Yes. As the girls, as the boys are coming from the uncle's place with a cow, as they go to the river, as there's dancing in the night, as a hero, the, the uncle has come but can't go into the bomb until the boy comes at nine o'clock in the night, then they give me meat, raw meat and uh, unga in a basket to go and cook ugali. Thank God Agnes that time was able to do that. That is all qualitative, but there can be a quantitative aspect. And, and, and listen carefully. There can be a quantitative aspect. I would like to know from the medical uh, records in that area, how many of these initiates of circumcision end up in hospital? Yes. How many have to go for tetanus jabs before they are circumcised? That, that, that quantitative aspect will be very small, but it will give me space to argue against the traditional approach to circumcision. Then I'll put it in my interpretation. Yeah. Okay. I I uh, please tafakari kuhayo. Look at this sequential design. Sequential uh design. Let me blow this up. Sequential up here is sequential. So don't 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 wonder now what is there. What has a hero hidden there? Huh? We can't see it. Huh? Are you seeing it? Sequential design. Uh, I want to know from my class, Cindy or, or Wekesa or Ndunge or Brenda, all this bright Ochami, Ochana, Helen, Ngosi, Amisi, when you see the word explanatory design where does your mind tell you explanatory design what does your mind tell you from what we have done in research methods qualitative it's qualitative i can't hear you qualitative qualitative explanatory qualitative explanatory Huh? Quantitative. It, it is, is quantitative, quantitative since it has to be empirically tested. Yes, we are going yeah. to explain the theory. Yeah. Quantitative. So when you see explanatory straight, you can see Quan. Look, Quan is there. Uh, sorry. 
let me just go back. Um, let, allow me to reduce this. I hope you can still see it. Uh, Juan is there. Let, let me push this down here so that you're able to see it. Can we mute? So we have Quan explanatory, Quan quantitative. Following up, you have Quan data and results. Then you go to interpretation. You should see why I am calling this an explanatory design, because the major part of this study will be quantitative. Exploratory. When you see the word exploratory, obviously qualitative. Observation. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, just a minute. When you see that, um, exploratory, the qual will be the bigger building up to the quant quantitative, then interpretation. But look at this sequential embedded design. There is before intervention, qual. Quant intervention trial. Qual after intervention, then interpretation. So who is embedded here? And please carry up your hands. Who is embedded here? Bon. Terry. Um, oh. Terry? Quantitative, quantitative. The quantitative is embedded. It is sitting in a qual environment. Correct. Yeah. So I've told you, don't think we are always embedded in qual. We can also embed quant. Prof, prof, <laughs> yes. embed does it, let me, allow me use this term. Embed does it mean to sandwich? <laughs> allow, it's there in the middle. Yeah. Intellectually, it is to sandwich. Yeah? Intellectually, before intervention, I did a qualitative study about circumcision. Or let me talk about koito. I don't know how many of us come from where I come from. The, the traditional uh, pre-wedding in among the Kalenjin people, you will go and attend a koito ceremony as an ethnographic study, a study where you sit in and none of those people know that you are a researcher. None of them know you, that you are a researcher, but you must be able to speak their language so you pick all these things, the number of hours you have to wait, the girl coming in, the paraffin, the blankets, the calabashes, the money. Then you do a quant intervention, a quant. You look at the demographics of the both the one who wants to marry and the one being married. You look at the demographics. You want to disabuse the idea that this custom is backward. So people who have degrees don't go through it. So you collect data on an on a academic status and economic background of, the, of, of where the, the girl or where the boy comes from. Then after that, you now go into the qual. How do the parents and the community come in how do the parents come in? Let's say the community. Now, I'm invited in many of those uh, setups because uh, I most of, I have a lot of friends from Rift Valley. So I'm invited in many of those setups. How how do non kalenjins behave in such a ceremony? So you know, there's the drinking of murusik. A lot of non kalenjins will look at murusik and and they'll see blackish milk. And uh, they, they, they will have to struggle to accept it. But if you have been there, you drink it, you know it's, it's medicinal, it's healthy, you gargle so many glasses of mursik or cups or calabashes. So we will, we will do the qual 
ask you questions, Ayiro, what do you think of this custom? What are the values? How does it compare with your area? Then you do the interpretation. Florence Macho, please, yes. Uh, Prof, as I'm looking yes. at this sequential embedded design, I am yes. tempted, tempted to imagine uh, the anthropological studies yeah. would fall squarely here. Am I correct? Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Anthropology, yes. But you know you want to spice it. Eh? Yeah. You want to spice it. So you, you don't just want dancing and music and happiness. You want to spice it. Like, for example, what kind of uh, bride prizes cut across the Marraquet, the Nandi, the Turgen, or the Keio? For example, this is still anthropology, but I want, I want to, to, to pick an aspect and, 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 and even related to what people would say, the level of awareness in terms of education and, and so on. But uh, the master's class in uh, policy and leadership, what Airo is doing is we are just about to knock the door of chapter one. So I hope many of these ideas are, are really running through your mind. And you are asking, my God, if I choose a mixed methods, I must look at several studies, two, three, four studies, so that I know whether I'll be in explanatory design, exploratory design, or sequential embedded design. You will not tell me if you want your thesis to prevail, propel you to another level. You will not tell me, you know me, I'm doing a mixed methods. Then when I ask you, what is the sequencing? You have no idea. Or what is the relevance of embedding the other design, you have no idea. I'll be sending you this PowerPoint and I want you to spend some Prof time on it. Prof yes, excuse me. Yes. You, I, I have actually just wanted to, to ask what is the real importance of embedding? <laughs> Can somebody help me answer that question? What, what is the importance of embedding? Embedding, what Kesa means, there are certain things that you cannot conclusively say about your study. Even, even when you do quan and qual, you still want to do some embedding. Um, and and uh, to embed is like, uh, I want to be careful. To embed is like to do what? Um, is to hide inside uh, so that it, it, can, it can allow you to, to see what is happening. So, so when we come to the actual research papers, you will see very quickly what embedding is. And even the notes I'm giving you after this will help you to get that. But keep asking yourself, what is it? I want you to look at these design options. Yes, Madiang, please go ahead. Oh, sorry, you've just gone ahead. I, I yeah. wanted to say that um, from your talk, what I have uh, gathered for, of embedding, one you've explained in which you either quantitative or qualitative is explaining the other, mm -hmm. but also you mentioned that one of the functions would be to validate the tools maybe that you are using uh, mm. before you go to the actual one. I've yeah. got those two functions. Oh, very, good. very good. Very good. Um, I think uh, I want you to look at these designs. This one, I don't want to go through it. I want you to look through them maybe with your partner, uh, the one you study with, your academic partner, concurrent triangulation. 
Look at, I'll just do the first two. Concurrent triangulation, equal priority, quan and qual. Remember, there's equal and unequal. Quan emphasis. If you see this in capital letters, I'm talking about notation, notation, notation. If you see this in capital letters, this is the this is the bulk of the study. That's the bulk of the study. That's what I'm saying. Like if you see both of these are capital, that is equal priority. When you see this capital and this in small letters, quan quantitative is emphasized. It is the bigger portion. When you come to qual and you see this is in capital and quan in small, then this is an essentially qualitative study with a small portion of quan. And it can be concurrent triangulation. In other words, you can do the two concurrently and then interpret. If you have concurrent embedded, you cannot have equal priority. Eh, hey, wekesa, Chris, unaelewa huh? hiyo? Yes, yes, prof. It can't, it, it can't be. Kwa nini? Tell me kwa nini? Usiniambie tu naelewa. Kwa nini? It is not applicable. If it is concurrent, embedded. You can't have equal priority. Are you getting it? You can't have. But quan emphasis, this will be quan. And a note, when you see brackets qual, that means this qual is embedded. This one is embedded in this. When you see qual in capital letters, that's the main study, and embedded is the quant. Then explanatory, of course, when I see explanatory, sequential, then I see exploratory, sequential, and then I see sequential embedded. I want you to learn this table. And you are lucky, if I was going to give you a multiple choice, in Gekua Hapadu. Look at this model. Concurrent triangulation design. There is quantitative, numeric data, survey, structured, observation, checklist, charts, quantitative data. And then you have statistical analysis. There you have quantitative data analysis. You have results. On this side, you have qualitative data collection, semi-structured interviews, observations, documents, pictures, and then you have data text and image data. Remember? And then when it comes to qualitative data analysis, we have done this coding, thematic analysis, and you have codes, themes, and uh, this was an example of grounded theory. You are forming a theory from observation. You bring this, you get results, and you compare the results, and then you have a model come out. So again, I'm being parsimonious. Occam's Reza. All those things we have talked up there. I've now summarized them on this slide. I want you to look at this explanatory sequential. Find time, study this, study this slide in your own time, but I've already explained. Then you will uh, look at qualitative research and quantitative research. Very, very important. This is all we have done together with analysis. You look at that. And this is, this is, exploratory sequential design 
Why is it exploratory? We are starting with qualitative and then coming to quantitative. Then this one, embedded research. Uh, I love this one. I love this one. There is quantitative data collection pretest. Then there is quantitative data collection post test. Then there is an intervention. The intervention process collection and analysis of qualitative data before, during, and after the trials. How are the patients reacting? How about those who have diabetes and have uh, high blood pressure? How are they reacting? You get that information as an intervention. Hey, don't go on. Don't go on with the post-test. There is a problem. Embedded research design. I'll leave this for a few minutes for it to sink. All right. Any anybody who wants to ask something about this? I hope the concept of embedding is beginning to make sense. Uh excuse me, Prof. Yes, please, uh Juliet. Allow me to ask this question, please. I just want to understand. Eh? Yeah. When when we talk about pretest here, I know it is before. Is it before going to collect data or what does it mean? And then there is post test. Yeah, good Can question. Help, help me understand, please. Yeah, the pretest yes. is the pilot. Call it the pilot. You are if you if you make a if you develop an and that's why I told you most of you I don't expect you to make to try and design instruments. You are going to use already validated instruments, or suppose this was an actual experiment. If you are going to release a drug like the COVID vaccine, you have to do a pretest. You must do a pilot on a certain number of uh, volunteers. Then you will need an intervention. You will have to collect data to, to, to know uh, before, during, and after the trial, how are they? I'm just giving an example. After that, you can now do a post-test that means you can now release the findings or you can release the instrument to collect data from the bigger population. So you can look at it as an actual experiment or just instruments. You must pretest, you must pilot before you take them out of the field. And in between, you need to do some intervention to validate those instruments or just to make sure that this drug is safe. So yeah. does it mean, does post-test mean uh, like now do, doing the analysis? No, this is data collection. We haven't done, I've not even gone to interpretation. Eh? Mm. I'm just okay. bringing in the embedding part of it, isn't it? Mm. Then we'll collect the data. And uh, when I say post-test, now I am free to release that questionnaire and then I'll analyze. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right. Very good. All right. Mixing the quan. Uh, Prof. Yeah, that's my dear. It's just something of interest. If you go two, two slides back, there is something uh, that you put there. Which one? That, uh, could it be that one? The one where you had the Creswell, the source. Where you had the source. Yeah, this is the one. And my apologies for this. You might have talked about it earlier. Um, yes, yeah. I just want to know it based on the fact that we've been doing APA. 
in mm. your source there, you put something in brackets in the progress. Yes. Um, could you help me understand what that means? That just That's means I don't this 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 work. I have used. Uh, I'm using this data before it is uh, published. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so mm -hmm. maybe it will come out in uh, 2026. Mm -hmm. This is our, there, there are even researchers now, Madiang, mm. or you can cite 2026 now, 2027. Oh, okay. Yeah, because they have come out and uh, validated, but the publication is still in progress. Okay. Right? Thanks for, thanks for your patience. Thanks, thanks. Okay. Um, mixing the quan and qual data Type of mixing, connecting, merging, and embedding. Type of design. When it is sequential, you are connecting your qual to quant or your quant to qual. One face builds on the other. Where mixing occurs in research between data analysis, phase one, and data collection phase two so i have done i've done that analysis of the quantitative analysis i did in kericho now i connect it so where mixing occurs i now use what i have gotten for results to develop an instrument for data collection for phase two that is connecting merging Concurrent. We are doing this at the same time. You bring the results together. After analysis of both quant and quant, you typically bring them in for discussion. And then embedding, sequential or concurrent, either building or bringing results together, or either phases, or I, I, either between phases or in discussion after analysis. So this can be, you've gotten the results, you use them to give you the instrument to take out to the field to collect data, or you have both results and uh, you start discussing them. Somebody asked this uh, much earlier. How do you mix these things? What does mixing? Mixing is connecting, merging, embedding. Methodological issues, uh, you will have to look at this. I want to leave this slide for you. Uh, concurrent designs and sequential designs. Uh, look at the methodological, the, the challenges. Uh, like here, they're asking you to be sensitive to bias from one data collection to the other. And this one in exploratory instrument design, consider qual data analysis approaches for developing the instrument. Of course, it has to be qual data analysis. So you look at that in your own time. And then I've given you examples to write a purpose statement for a triangulation design. So I'll be expecting things like this mixed method study will address what triangulation mix, mixed methods design will be used. And it is a type of design in which different but complementary data can be collected on the same topic. In this study, dash, quantitative instruments will be used to test the theory of and so on. So this, this is just an illustration for you to use to sediment your thinking. And then uh, uh, write a purpose statement for an embedded design. I'll, uh, I've given you an example. Write a purpose statement for an explanatory design. So this is very important for you. This from slide 35. I'm actually helping you to know how you will phrase your purpose statement for an explanatory design, uh, writing a purpose statement for an exploratory design. Again, just go through. I would advise that you try to study in groups and try to come up with those uh, designs. Qualitative research questions. Qualitative central question begin with what or how. 
focus on a single phenomenon, circumcision, uh, poverty, uh, twilight uh, women in, in cities, and then use explorative verbs, discover, understand, explore. It is non-directional language. And then uh, quantitative research questions can be hypotheses or questions. State the variables, independent, dependent, mediating, covariates. Develop from theory. Use distinct measures for independent and dependent variables. Order, various from, order variables from independent to dependent. And then uh, writing research questions, hypothesis in a mixed uh, research. Uh, write qualitative research questions and write quantitative research questions, hypothesis. Somebody asked, in a mixed method, do we have questions, hypotheses, or objectives? Now this is the answer. You'll have both questions, research questions, and hypotheses. Um, a new type of research question, a mixed methods, I've given you some examples. Uh, for example, it can be methodologically focused. To what extent do the qualitative results confirm the quantitative results? And then uh, 43, order the topics for your plan. Uh, this is what I'm coming to, chapter one, introduction. Uh, chapter two, literature review. Chapter three, methods. And we'll go on up to interpretation of those results and ethical issues as well. And then additional resources, some books for you to look up in the library for your reading and articles also. Uh, under this. It's a very, very important area. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, we are, we have some idea now of what mixed methods are. So you see, I would be doing injustice if, if I did not cover this. Uh, you'll be half cooked. So uh, Thank you very much. You'll get these slides sent to you this evening, as is the custom. We are going to take a break of five minutes, and then come back. I want to, to tell you what I want you to do for assignment, and then we'll finish at eight today. Okay, so take a break.
But for me, I'm oh. interested. I, I, I actually write notes. And you know what I want? What I want you to be in is when we are starting just, chapter one. Just mute. You, you're not. I mean, Prof, you're muted. Come back, everybody. We now want to. I just want to lead you into this. Um, into sealing the gaps in mixed methods research. I want to bring in policy and leadership. Uh, so. Uh, this will be class reading. Uh, uh, Ruth Ngosi, start us off. Are you online? Yes. Mm -hmm. The logic of mixing research methods. There are many different strategies for collecting and analyzing data to address public affairs questions. A public manager, in brackets, or key staff, of course, faces important choices at the, out, sorry, at the outset of any research or evaluation project about what assessment approach to, to use as each approach has its own strengths and weaknesses. Rather than settling for the strengths and weaknesses of any one approach, you could instead choose to pair multiple research methods together. One could use both interviews and surveys to address a research question. Alternatively, one could use budgetary data combined with on-site observation and document collection. For example, in the previous chapter, chapter 19, we noted that for an assessment tool such as benefit cost analysis, BCA, provides a specific quantitative indication of the net efficiency or economy of a proposed project after competing values or contextual factors other, might diverge. Other, other competing. In chapter nine, we noted that while an assessment tool such as a benefit cost analysis, BCA, provides a specific quantitative indication of the net efficiency or economy of a proposed project, other competing values or contextual factors might diverge from the reported BCA ratio. Incorporating an assessment of not so easily measured values through qualitative data methods from subject matter experts or affected citizens can offer a more robust and wholesome analysis than strict reliance on the BCA alone. It is reasonable to highlight the notion that a combination of different methodological approaches may provide a more compelling strategy than any other method in isolation. In other words, different forms of data collection and analysis used in conjunction with one another can help converge on a clearer picture of the outcome we are interested in assessing. This chapter will present a variety of strategies for combining different research methods into a single research project. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know, uh, Boaz, are you in class today? Boaz is not in class today. Um, uh, Paula Mata. Yes, Prof. Okay. Amata, just tell us, what, what am I saying in this passage from my book? What am I saying? Uh, what I'm trying to get is that when you, are, you, 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 when you select uh, one tool maybe to for data collection, it might not be enough. You might get you might not get uh, all that you need or the expected the information you are looking for. So it would be prudent enough maybe to merge them together or use both, use both for you to get the expected results. Mm. Yes. 
That's good thinking. Um, I, I, I want us to deepen our conversation a little. Um, um, let me deepen this conversation and, and look here. Um, if you take this, that material, And uh, Machio, I want you to just read that material and then give me your interpretation in terms of mixed methods and uh, the research strategies. Lawrence, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm in a blackout, so. Oh, okay. I hope me, uh, you guys can hear me. Oh, yeah, we can hear you. And, I can yeah, read, though. If you can okay. hear me, I can read. Okay, go ahead. So the highlighted portion, right? Mm. We go noted ahead. that while an assessment tool, such as benefit cost analysis, in bracket BCA, provides a specific quantitative indication of the net efficiency or economy of a proposed project. Other competing values or contextual factors might diverge from the reported BCA ratio. Incorporating an assessment. Just, just stop there. What are okay. these? Uh, uh, what are macho? What are these? First of all, we have been told the BCA is quantitative data on the cost benefit analysis. What yeah. and then then we are told other competing values or contextual factors might diverge from the reported CBA ratio. The cost benefit analysis ratio might be was 0 0.5. And when we bring in these other competing values or contextual factors, we might find that that ratio now has come down to 0 0.3. Uh, what is this person bringing in? Interventions. Yeah, but but what what uh, Matthew? What what is this person? Which paradigm are they pushing us into now? Um, this is my uh, understanding. I could be wrong, but uh, when you set out to do the research and you've prepared uh, and then now when you start the project you have to put in mind that there are other factors that could hinder what you're projecting to see and mm -hmm. uh, therefore it should be at the back of your mind that it's not a straight jacket mm. okay carry on incorporating an assessment of not so easily measured values through qualitative data collection methods from subject matter experts or affected citizens can offer a more robust and fulsome analysis that strict reliance on the than strict reliance on the BCA alone. Yeah. I think I, now I, this one gives yeah. us a, a better understanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, and making a case for the mixed methods because as you set out and, and mm. as you set out to do your research, relying on a straight jacket, like you had said in the beginning, that you know, people come in and say, I want to do qualitative or I want to do quantitative. But when you get to now looking at the research itself, you realize it is not enough. It yeah. will not be convincing enough if you rely on one particular method. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I I, I think. I would like my class to to read where we are going. To read where we are going. Um, let me just pop into. Uh, I'll send you these notes. These these are now these are the notes that sediment the PowerPoint that I gave. Like we have done throughout our research methods. You have. A, I hope you have filed these notes because you need them. 
this is the book that we are waiting from uh, KLB. Uh, it's taken years, but I'm just being patient. All right. Um, I would like to ask um, from our class, uh, I would like to ask uh, Sarah Angachi. Angachi, have you ever... Sarah Angachi, are you there? Yes, Prof. Yeah, Sarah, uh, please speak us from the advantages of uh, mix. By the way, hey, by the way, I'm hoping that um, uh, everybody is with me and beginning to realize that, my God, um, this mixed methods will inevitably run into it. Even if it means just embedding a little of the other of the other approach. I hope um, that's where we, we, we are going with you. All of you are going with me because that's where I'm taking you. But I'm not saying everybody will adapt this. No. We, we also, we are at liberty to to be purely quantitative, purely qualitative. Uh, again, that will be my my excitement, whichever method. Okay, carry on. Um, uh, our reader, please. Advantages of mixing research methods. Mixing research methods can serve a number of purposes and presents a number of advantages over using a single research or evaluation approach. Most broadly, each research approach has its own strengths and weaknesses. It is fair to acknowledge the real possibility that if you rely on one single research method, your results may be limited by the method's strengths and weaknesses. For example, you may find it useful to do a survey of a large number of nonprofit organization to see what they list as the primary barriers to their participation in emergency planning activities. Of course, this approach will have its limitations. You may have to use short questions with few options if you hope to reach a large number of people. These short questions may limit your ability to identify truly innovative ideas because you have, jump. You have, okay, because you have to list the options in advance. Mixing in some in-depth interview or other methods may allow you to complement the survey with a deeper understanding of the barriers to nonprofit participation. Of course, the in-depth in interviews will be limited by themselves. You are only able to include a small number of people relative to the survey. The best approach may be to use both the survey and the interviews to offset the weaknesses of each. Yeah, so you see, we are dealing with the two approaches, but we are just looking at the instrumentation. And uh, that, that uh, highlighted in blue is what we have been doing in the PowerPoints. So I'll leave it for you to discuss with your members. Thank you very much. That was very good reading. Very nice, Sarah. Uh, Sam Nyabera, are you there, Sam Nyabera? <clears throat> yes, sir, I'm there. Yeah, uh, please pick it up from there. <clears throat> okay. Um, one popular metaphor to describe the advantage of mixing methods is triangulation. Triangulation involves the estimation of some unknown point by reference to two or more known points. The geometry of formal triangulation is less important than the basic idea. 
if you do not know where a specific point is or the answer to a specific research question, you may be able to deduce the answer from the answers to related points or the results of related research. In mixing research, in, in mixing research methods, this means that the information you are looking for may not be discoverable through one method. Instead, you can use multiple methods to get at partial answers, limited by the weakness of a specific research method. Which one, which when combined reveal the full answer? The goal is to select methods where the strengths of one research method offset the weaknesses of another. Okay, pause. <clears throat> Let us stop there. We have met triangulation. I was just being cheeky here. <laughs> I know the non-mathematicians in this class uh, will begin to shiver. One popular metaphor to describe the advantage of mixed methods is triangulation. Listen to the next sentence. Triangulation involves the estimation of some unknown point by reference to two or more known points. That is triangulation. Uh, just, just think of a triangle. The geometry of formal triangulation is less important than the basic idea. So I'm just saying, in mixing research methods, the information you are looking for may not be discoverable through one method. Instead, you can use multiple methods to get a partial, to get a partial answers, which when combined reveal the full answer. So again, none of my students will look like strangers when we talk about triangulation in mathematics and in research. Uh, I want greater class participation. Silvenus, Silvenus Getera, Getare, sorry. Silvana, sorry, Getari, are you online? Yes. Yeah, please pick it up. Mm -hmm. I can't see well. Oh, you can't. Why? From a, from a second justification. Not from. Can you see this? Yes, yes. Okay. A second justification for mixing method is corroboration. Corroboration involves the comparison of the results of studies using different methods to find similar answers that emerge from those studies. The process for corroboration is like getting a second opinion from a doctor. If the first doctor tells you that you need surgery, you will not seek a second opinion by asking the same doctor the next day. You know what he or she is going to say. You want to ask a separate doctor. Sorry. You want to ask a separate doctor, preferably without telling him or her about the origin, original opinion. If both doctors recommend surgery, you can be more comfortable with the conclusion that surgery is the best option. In mixing, in mixing research methods, Corroboration involves using different data collection or analytic techniques to answer the same research question and accepting the answer if the techniques agree. Asante San, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful reading. But I hope, I hope that example has sunk home. And always everybody is telling you, get a second opinion. Yes. Isn't it? <laughs> Vivian Kimadi, are you there? Vivian? Uh, yes, Prof. Are you able to read? Uh, yeah. Yeah, and you know this, I, I'm beginning to, to give marks for people who are authentic. They show themselves on the screen. So I'll ask Carol to, to check for me this presentation. Follow what I'm about on a feature feature. Uh, Kwanini, they're not part of this congregation. Uh, I don't see the Holy Spirit flowing through them. Uh, and yet I'm the Padre. Carry on. Uh, yes. Other justification is the opposite of corrobor corroboration. Uh, comprehens 
Comprehensiveness. Comprehensiveness combines the results of various research methods to chart all of the various possible answers to a research question. Uh, with corroboration, your goal was to eliminate potential answers that were the product of one research method, but not the others. With comprehensiveness, the goal is to make as long a list as possible of potential answers. The best analog to comprehensiveness may be the search for vacation plane flights. Uh, you may want to you may want to use various search engines and websites to look for inexpensive flights for your vacation. You will not eliminate such results that appeared in one search engine, but not another. In this case, you are using different search engines because they may find flights that others miss. If you want to catalog all nonprofit organizations active in emergency planning, you may um you may similarly want to employ different methods. You could combine interviews, surveys, document analysis, and news reports to make as comprehensive a list as possible. Each of these techniques is likely to miss some participants. Combining the various techniques may give you the most comprehensive list possible. Carry on. Okay. In the end, the reason for using a mixed method strategy is simple. You would want to investigate a mixed method strategy when it will allow you to answer questions that you can't answer otherwise. This may be the case where the individual tools you have available are limited in important ways, but can be combined. This may also be the case be the case where you need to have a great deal of confidence in any results you find. You find. Very good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very, very yeah, good. Thank you. Uh, very, very good reading. Yeah, uh, thank you. I don't want to be biased. I want. I don't want to be biased. So I want us to look at disadvantages as we wind up the class this evening. Disadvantages. Taslin or Tienu? Are you online? Yes, yes, I am. Yes, go ahead, Taslim. Um, um, disadvantages of mixing research methods. Mixing method, uh, mixing methods offer a number of advantages or general benefits, as it as can discussed. About... What? Uh, can we mute so that is only Taslim? Yes. Go ahead. Over the use of individual research methods. However, like most, like most everything in life, there are both benefits and costs to most, uh, to most any chosen uh, course of action. Thus, it is important. Taslim, just a minute. I must apologize. That is horrible English. Eh? However, like most everything in life. Eh? <laughs> But just understand your lecture is not, is a science. <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, carry on. So there's not a slin, it is me. My language is terrible. Carry on. Thus, it is important to recognize oh. that uh, combining oh, research... Slin, repeat. I start from the beginning. Uh, please, yes. Okay. Mixing methods offer a number of advantages or general benefits as discussed above over the use of individual research methods. However, like most everything in life, there are both benefits and costs to most of action. Thus, it is important to recognize that combining research methods also uh, creates complexities and costs in a variety of ways. Most obviously, mixing research methods require completing uh, multiple research projects. In the Palan, palanche, that word uh, of. Uh, in the palance. In the in, palace. In the vogue. In the manner uh, of speaking. Yeah. So um, I in, say this. Uh, just a minute. Otieno. Uh, yeah. Unapenda kukimbia sana. Unapenda kukimbia sana. 
if if you have such a word, I told you very quickly, do a smart lookup. If it doesn't give you anything, go deeper. Don't just move. Uh, and then you become what we want you to become. So you check up parlance as, as we did. Uh, do the theos theosaras if it doesn't look for smart looking and then look at the results from the media. But parlance is just in the language, in the congregation, in the manner of speaking, in the nuance of mixed methods research. Yeah, okay, carry on. In the... In the in the parlance of mixing research methods, these are known as streams. To mix a survey and an interview protocol will require completing two full research protocols or streams. The intent of mix of uh, the intent to mix research methods does not free you to do a poor job with one component of the project. A project that mixes interviews and surveys should seek to do an excellent survey and um, and excellent in excellent interviews and to combine them to answer questions better than the excellent project would have separately this means that a mixed method project may take um, uh, as much time as each of the components combined in brackets though there are some opportunities to economize on time Yes, uh, stop there. Uh, thank you very much, Taslin. Um, Vivian Kimadi. Vivian Kimadi, are you there? If not, Gaki. Yeah, yeah, I am, Prof. Yeah, please go ahead. Similarly, uh, mixing methods can be an expensive proposition. Each research method has its own source of expenses. Surveys may cost money to write, duplicate, distribute, and collect. Interviews require hiring interviewers and possibly compensating interviews. interviewees. Uh, site research requires paying observers and the time associated, associated with memoing, memoing. All of these approaches require time into brackets and time is money to analyze data. As you combine research methods with a study, we also accumulate expenses related to data collection and analysis. While, uh, while one, one might ideally want to combine a variety of methods, you may not have the money in practice to accomplish this mixture. Carry on. There, are, um, there are also intellectual challenges peculiar to the mixture of research methods. While we have emphasized a pragmatic approach to research, Scholars and practitioners often associate specific research methods with, with specific philosophical assumptions about research. Survey research typically assumes that there is a single answer to a research question, often one that you can represent with a number, into brackets a quantitative orientation. In depth, interviews are Interviews, interviews and some types of ethnographic site research often assume that there is no single answer to a research question and that the answer depends on the researcher him or herself. You could combine these methods, but you cannot simultaneously answer an objective and a subjective view of reality. The strongest, uh, the strongest critics of mixing methods argue that many methods are incommen incommensurable that is, a researcher ought not to combine research methods because of incompatibility between the foundational assumptions in each method. Proponents of mixing methods counter with the commensurability assumption. The assumption that one can combine methods historically associated with specific uh, competing paradigms possibly under an umbrella like a pragmatic paradigm. Mixed research, mixed research strategies Sorry, can... Carry on. Mixed research strategies can provide a great deal of confidence in your findings. However, they are not easy to manage. Each stream adds to the cost of, of the project as well as complicating the management of the project. You should only embark on a mixed methods project if you are con 
if you are convinced that the strengths of the approach exceed that of the course. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much, Vivian. Good reading. Thank you. Uh, I just want you to note that uh, there's something salient here. Um, you must have some resources, particularly for this. This is what I've learned from my research. Compensating interviewees and then hiring the interviewers. You must have some resources. If you're going to do a genuine good study, so when I was doing this uh, World Bank study in Asal, 14 Asal areas in Kenya, uh, looking at uh, attainment indices in education, I had 600 students from Moi University. And we had to send them across the counties and uh, you can imagine across the country, hiring them and also compensating the interviewees. If they have come, to a hall in a school, you must have lunches for them, you must have transport, and uh, maybe a token for airtime. You're not bribing them. Yeah, you're not bri bribing them, but you're trying to ensure that uh, you have them to give you the results you're looking for. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I promised that we would end at eight. Uh, I know we're supposed to have ended at 8.30. Uh, I want you to look at designing mixed methods. By the way, we can finish this. Oh, yeah, we can finish this. Then my conscience will be clear. I can sleep soundly. Uh, and uh, Terry, are you on online? Terry or Gaki? No, no, no. Yes, yes. Prof. 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 Yes, Wakesa. Ladies have have read so many times. I think. Oh no, they are more than you. They are more <laughs> than you. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Terry. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Designing mixed method search. Once you have decided to embark on a mixed method search. Ah, uh, you are cutting, Terry. Can't hear you. Can I no. keep Stop. Can we have? Uh, I think. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, no. Francis Sochami, are you online? Terry is cutting badly. Ochami? Yes, bro. I'm here. I'm here. Please finish for us. The reading is. All right. Designing mixed methods research. Once you have decided to embark on a mixed method study, you will have to make a number of decisions about how to structure and combine your chosen methods. The real advantage of mixed methods uh, research comes in the, in, in the skillful combination of methods rather than two or more entirely separate uh, research projects. It is essential that you plan for the mixture of methods from uh, the very beginning rather than waiting until you have started and then combine the methods ad hoc. To assist in the design of mixed method studies, proponents of uh, mixing research methodologies have adopted a specific notation system to describe potential systems. Yeah, that is the, the qual, quant, the capital, and uh, the non capital. I've already discussed that. Carry on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the notational system allows authors to summarize their approach quickly, as well as being clear about the relationship between the components of their study. Recall that a chief challenge of mixed methods research is the management of the various streams. A notational system allows a manager to define clearly the relationships between the streams and makes management easier. Furthermore, the clarity of the notation system allows one to discuss and debate various designs at the research design stage to make sure that you end up with the best mixed design for your project needs. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that is your filling notes for research methods. And what, what I want you to do for me, the logic of mixing research methods is to do a synopsis and take note, a synopsis of one page. 
just a synopsis of one page of the logic of mixing research methods, single spacing, font 12. The rubric, single spacing font 12 times numeral. So that is the assignment. And uh, I'm charging your class rep to write that. And Chris, write that clearly. You'll send it to me so that I can document. I don't think uh, any of the, the coordinators of the program are online. So I don't want us to create confusion. So I, am, I am there. <laughs> oh, I, OK. I keep oh. dropping because of the internet. No, no, that's OK. So this is, this is a synopsis of one page font 12. Times Roman. Single spacing. Yes. And uh, this will carry five marks. Five marks. So to memorize us, 60 plus five plus what? We are already at 65. So the, the quiz would just be maybe 20, 25%. But it depends on whether you are doing it right. When you are doing a synopsis, I will not expect citations in a synopsis. No. And uh, I hope you know that uh, most of you know uh, this is uh, this is uh, uh sorry. Uh, research methods. Just to be complete in your synopsis. Yeah, that's it. That's the title. All right. Um, any any observations? So, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I think they have asked whether this is a single, uh, this is a, an individual assignment or? A individual. Synopsis, individual. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you can see now I'm feeling at home. I have only one, one thing to cover with you, and is ethics in research, ethics in research, and then uh, the unit of analysis in research, part of your chapter three. Those two are the last items in chapter three. Ethics and the unit of analysis. So that should not take us more than half an hour. And then we will start with the chapter one, the background. I cannot, I wanted to do something on APA, but I would want the librarians to finish. We'll pick it up when you're writing the proposal. Yeah. Any, any comment, any, uh, Closing. Anybody? No, very good. So you are all satisfied. Uh, you're feeling on top of the world because I want you to be happy about your course and your research methods. Madian, please say something. Uh, prof, sometimes it's good to appreciate Asante Sana for this class. Um, and the, the last one also, they were absolutely interesting. Shukran. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, there being no other business, Carol, uh, I want to wish the class well. Uh, I'm going to send uh, the full PowerPoint presentation. We're also going to send... Uh, these summary notes, and of course, our two devotions today and the other day. Okay. okay. Thank you, Prof. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Thank you. Today's class has been parsimonious. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I guess I would learn it.